Good morning, everybody. Good morning. May the peace of Christ be with you. This morning, I want to welcome everybody to Sterling Mennonite Fellowship, virtual, hopefully one of our final virtuals. We'll see what happens in the next month or so. Um, I want to welcome everyone who is joining us live and those who are tuning in on our YouTube channel. So welcome uh, to June the 27th, 2021. Who knew we would can still be doing virtual, virtual church, but I'm so glad that so many of you have uh, tuned in live to join us. And it is nice to see your faces, be it in very small boxes. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all in live. And maybe we can meet in a park sometime soon. Um, so uh, to begin, we have some announcements. And um, it out. there are announcements uh, that come uh, in the bulletin, which will be posted in the chat box and also available on the Sterling website. And there's a special announcement um, or presentation that Moses would like to show us a video from Camps of Meeting. And I think we're gonna start with that. Thanks, Doris. Yeah, I'm just gonna share this video that comes to us from Camps with Meeting. Of course, uh, Camps is part of Mennonite Church, Manitoba. And since things are so different this year, uh, they're going through some challenges, financial challenges. And even though camps are running, they're very limited. So they're doing a fundraising campaign. Uh, and I would just wanna show their latest video from that. If, if that's something that you are able to contribute to, that's, that, that's great. Uh, but then I also wanted to say that they are looking for some volunteers. I, I've been in touch with them. Uh, they, they've filled up pretty well, um, but there are some weeks in July where they could really use some maintenance help at Camp Assiniboia. So if you would be interested in cutting grass, um, in helping out in maintenance, th those kinds of things, uh, then uh, talk to me and I can connect you. Uh, and, um, and, and they're also looking for some health officers for their one day pop up camps. So th those are just one day and they're in different locations in the city or in southern Manitoba. Uh, and so if you are in the health care, if you're a healthcare worker, and you wanted to participate in that way, also let me know and, and I can connect you as well. Um, for the maintenance at Camp Assiniboia, that is something where you could just go out for a day and help out, or you could go and stay there, have one of the cabins and stay there for the week. Um, so if you're interested in that, let me know. And I'm going to share this uh, fundraising video uh, from Camps with Meeting. Camp is full of challenges of personal goal setting, of achievements and victories, both large and small. As campers return year after year, the challenges get more challenging, but the rewards are all the more sweet. There is one reward, however, that remains elusive to all but a few. The privilege of ringing the camp bell. Oh, hey, I've always wanted to ring that camp bell. I met every challenge that the counselors could throw at me, but hey, I never earned the ultimate prize. Like, I've never, I've never rung that bell. You know, there's a story that used to go around campfires late at night about a camper that actually rang the bell. I think it's an urban legend. It's not legend. My grandmother told me the story. She wouldn't lie, although she never did say what the camper did to ring the bell. We never speak of it. <laughs> Be it myth, legend, or truth, we'll never know for sure, but it's time to bring the bell out from the shadows and into the light. Bell ringing will no longer be a privilege for the few. What was once unachievable is now within everyone's reach. You, yes, even you, can ring the bell by joining our Ring Up the Cash Camps with Meaning COVID Relief Campaign. We're the Langelots family. We signed up for the fundraiser and it was super easy. We are gonna ride as a family along with two other members of our family. We're gonna ride from Winnipeg to Camp Assiniboia and back. Pick your activity and join us. 
<laughs> oh, hey. How you doing? Just watching the Jets bounce the Oilers. Yeah, you know what I found out? I found out you can give money to camp online with a simple push of the button. Now, I'm not into that riding and biking stuff, like running around. Not for me. But you know what? It's super simple. Just go online, one button, push, make the donation. You know what I did? Contacted my friends on Facebook and Instagram. Told them to donate. It was easy. And you know what I did? Celebrated my birthday, said, no gifts. Just make a donation to camp. It's all part of their Ring Up the Cash campaign. You should give it a try. It's one push. You know, one push of the button. Hey, whoa. Okay, see you later. There are all kinds of ways to support our beloved Camps with Meaning. You can donate online, set up your own page, and get your family and friends to make a donation too. Or you can run, walk, bike, skip, canoe your way to the camp bell. And once you reach that bell, you can ring it. You can ring it for as long as you want. You can ring it like you've never rung a bell before. You can finally, finally ring that bell and know deep down inside that you've achieved the unachievable. And in the process, help Camps with Meaning and all future children, future families, future school groups and churches come enjoy our beautiful camps. Camp is full of challenges, of achievements, of victories, this is our camp challenge for 2021. Are you up for it? Thank you, Moses. So like, yeah, like I said, if anybody's interested in volunteering at camp uh, this summer, just let me know uh, and, and I will connect you. Doris, if I could also make one other announcement just about our summer book club. So last summer we did a book club, uh, Kennedy and I led uh, a group discussion and this summer we wanna do the same. So if you're interested in joining our summer book club, we wanna meet four times over the summer months uh, and read a book together. The book we're choosing is called The Blue Parakeet by Scott McKnight. And the reason we're choosing that book is because we anticipate or we know that in the fall, we want to get into some more conversations around some difficult questions. Uh, and so this book is really a good preparation in terms of how do we interpret the Bible? How do we read the Bible? How do we discern together? Um, and so if you're interested in that, uh, please talk to me. I'd love to get a book for you and uh, just try to coordinate what day would work best for us as a group. Thank you. Thanks, Moses. Uh, for our preparing our hearts this morning in our opening, I want us to um, be mindful of what's going on in our community. Um, Moses is going to talk about Anabaptist and community this morning in his sermon. And um, we've got so many things happening in our wider Canadian community. This week um, is Canada Day coming up, and there's a lot of talk about how we can respectfully uh, celebrate or perhaps mourn um, and grieve some of the things that have happened in our country over the, the past century or so, um, which our Indigenous community brothers and sisters are um, facing and have faced, and we are only now some people becoming mindful of, um, of what had happened and looking forward to what will happen as a result of some of the things uh, that we are learning and all of the children that we grieve the loss of. So I want to open our open our service this morning um, with a prayer. And as we uh, listen to the rest of the service going on, think about that community and our community and how it, it is impacting us on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's bow together. Creator, we give you thanks for all you are and all you bring to us for our visit within your creation. In Jesus, you place the gospel in the center of the sacred circle through which all creation is related. You show us the way to live a generous and compassionate life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment as we grow in your spirit and as we move towards reconciliation with our wider First Nations Indigenous community. For you are God now and forever. Amen.
we will now have a song uh, followed by the children's feature and scripture reading. Hello. I'm just gonna change my view so I can see more of you. Where are my kids at? We are the Christians. Should I go carry Matthew over? Hi, Weebs. Sure, if he's willing. <laughs> no, he's forced to come and join us. Hi, Kinsley. How's baby brother? You're muted. Is he good? Hi, Matthew. <laughs> well, welcome here. It's good to see all your faces. As Doris said, I hope that we get to see each other in person very, very soon, because I miss all of you and I miss being in person. Um, and in our, in our community, uh, Moses today is gonna talk about community. And that's a really important, 
an important part about um, our Anabaptist faith and belief. And um, it's, it's kind of what makes us who we are. We're, we're a group of people that, that gather together and um, we need to be together. So this quarantine and COVID has been very hard for, for our church and for all of our um, communities because we are people that need to gather together. And as, as much as this is a great um, alternative, it's not quite the same thing. Um, so I was wondering what kind of communities do you guys, do you guys see yourself as a part of? Do you see yourself as, um, are you in communities at your school? Do you see yourself as a part of a community there with friends? Or maybe teams like soccer teams or dance or I don't know what kids do these days, art clubs. It's been a while. Or just friends on your streets, maybe your neighbors or your community. There's lots of different ways that we, that we find community in our lives. And something, I'm not wearing this blanket because I'm cold. I have no air conditioning in my apartment. So it's literally the worst. Um, but I'm wearing it because it's something that represents community to me. And it, it reminds me of the communities that I've been a part of. And that means so much to me. So I actually have... If you can see this, I have a couple of these, they're t-shirts. So the VBS, uh, I have no idea how many years that was ago in sunrise, but it's a VBS t-shirt. So it reminds me of my, of my time in VBS. Um, this is actually a middle school. So like years ago, a middle school t-shirt. I have a t-shirt from when I was a staff at camp. So a little less time ago, um, I have some from Cross Lake. It's, it doesn't even actually have a t-shirt, uh, the t-shirt emblem on it. It just has signatures of all of the friends I made up there. Um, and I actually sleep with this every night because it's so comfy, but it also is something that I treasure so much because it reminds me of the communities that I'm a part of and that I continue to be a part of. And how special they are because they, they're like a family to me. And I have so many more in here that I could show you, but I just wanted to show you a little bit of, of the communities that I'm a part of and maybe get you thinking about the communities that you're a part of and how much they mean to you and how much they, you know, represent who you are. Um, so yeah, if you, are listening to Moses's sermon, you can think about what community means to you and what communities are, are special to you and that you're a part of and, and that make, make up your world. Um, Cause it's important as Anabaptists, as, as people who, as Winnipeggers, Canadians, it's, uh, it makes up who we are. So I hope you have a great rest of your day and I hope we will soon be able to meet as a community because I miss this community and I miss all of you. So have a great rest of your Sunday, my friends. Good morning. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be reading from Acts 2, 42 through 47, and I'll be reading from the NRSV. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their numbers, those who were being saved. The word of the Lord.
Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Doris, for worship leading today. It is good to be with you once again. And uh, we know that just this past week, uh, as we have been reopening some of our things in, in Winnipeg and in Manitoba, uh, they've also announced that the code is changing from red to orange. And, and so we, we don't have any announcements for you yet about what that means for us and for the summer, but uh, I know that council will be discussing that and just seeing what is the right way for us as a church to move forward in this time. So you can anticipate some more news about that at some point. But we do look forward, uh, as has been, been mentioned already, to be together once again in person. We want to continue today looking at our series called Back to Anabasics, looking at some of the fundamentals of Anabaptism and our Mennonite faith to show us how it might uh, lead us and guide us in our time moving forward. We've been through some deep and troubled waters, and often we need to reflect by looking back and to learn from those who have come before us. Last week, we started looking at what I call Palmer Becker's triad of Anabaptist faith, which, if you remember, um, is that Jesus is the center of our faith, community is the center of our life, and reconciliation is the center of our work. Last week, we talked about uh, the first one, that Jesus is the center of our faith, and that since the beginning of Anabaptism, and of course, Anabaptists linked themselves to the early church. So since the early church, Christians have always believed that Jesus is someone to be followed, that Jesus is someone who asks for and requires our full allegiance. And so the early Anabaptists really tried to take Jesus seriously and longed to follow after Jesus in their lives. Now, we were asking that same question of us. Are we willing to take the words, the teachings, and the example of Jesus seriously in our lives today and in our Christian walk? In our Christian walk, when it comes uh, to these polarizing times, you know, what does it mean to love our enemies when our enemies are those people online who post things that we don't always agree with, or just people who have different political or social views? In this time of divisiveness, it's really important for us as a church to, to ask, how are we going to take Jesus seriously? Well, today we want to talk a bit about community. And um, community as the center of our lives. N next week, I, always want, I also wanted to say that we are going to be talking about reconciliation. But for next week, we're, we're very excited to have with us our two witness workers, Bucky Kim and Suk Young Park, who are going to be preaching. Um, and they are our witness workers in South Korea. And next week as well, we're going to have a bit of a celebration as we formalize a partnership between Sterling and Bucky Kim and Suk Young Park. So next week, um, join us for that as we, we celebrate that and hear more about their work and what they are doing in Korea when it comes to reconciliation. Okay, today we want to talk about community. Community as the center of our lives. Now, that doesn't mean that Anabaptists don't like solitude, but it means that Anabaptists do not believe that our faith can live be lived out in isolation. God has created us, created humanity for a relationship. And, and community is basically relationships that are held together by something that we have in common. So like Emily said, right, there's many different kinds of community. You're in a community simply because you live somewhere beside other people. Uh, and, and your location brings you into community with them. <laughs> other community as well, based on, uh, based on interests, uh, based on hobbies. Uh, you could be part of clubs, be part of sports teams, uh, school groups, all these things, you know, we describe as community. Well, Sterling Mennonite Fellowship is a community. And what brings us together is our faith in Jesus Christ and our commitment to one another and to what God is doing in us and through us. But one thing I want to say 
is that faith isn't just another interest, right? J Jesus instructs us to leave everything behind and to follow after him. And so our identity as children of God and, and participants in God's reconciling work, that's much more significant than just the sports that we like. For me, you know, I see that as central to who I am, e even more central than being a husband or a father. Because my identity as a Christian informs every other part of my life. That's who I am at the core. And I see everything else in my life through that, through that lens of being a follower of Jesus. And, and so if this faith that is so core to us is what unites us, then community maybe isn't even the best term. And, and that's why we often refer to ourselves as family. Right? We, we are the Sterling family. We are siblings in Christ because we have all been adopted into God's family. Uh, but for the sake of today, and I don't want to mess up Palmer Becker's work, so we're going to continue just saying community is the center of our life. Now, I do have a confession to make, um, and, and I want to take you back about 12 years when I, uh, a boy from Toronto, uh, met a girl from Winnipeg. And as we got to know each other, then I found out that, oh, well, she's a Mennonite. And as the reality became more clear that maybe we were going to spend time together, um, I have to confess that what first came to my mind was that this was going to be my future. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not literally, but I did have to learn a lot about what it actually meant to be Mennonite because I had no context for what the Mennonite community was all about. Now, I, I still actually think that some of my family uh, imagines me to live this way, <laughs> uh, or at least they make fun of me for it, but, but I could take it. Uh, but there, there's a reason why, you know, a lot of kind of popular culture has a certain image uh, when it comes to who Mennonites are, right? Mennonites and Anabaptists uh, are often confused for, for Amish or Hutterites, although we all kind of belong to the same heritage and the same uh, uh, Mennonite World Conference. And so we are related in a sense, uh, but it is kind of known in wider circles that Mennonites, Amish, Hutterites have a certain emphasis on community. And that community living is important to them so much so that they would even um, forsake other things in the world to, to live in that way. Since the birth of Anabaptism in the 16th century, community has always been a central focus. Now, we might ask, okay, hey, why is that, right? Why, why do we say Jesus is a central focus for Anabaptists? Well, the reason is because the, the Anabaptists looked back to the early church and wanted to live more faithfully to the early church uh, than what the church had become in the 16th century. And the same thing goes here too. Why were the Anabaptists so focused on community? Well, the Anabaptists, they, they look back at, at the early church and some of the writings in the New Testament and, and shaped their faith and shaped their community based on that. So if the Anabaptists were going to take Jesus seriously, then they also wanted to take the early church seriously or the calling of Christ to live as the Christian community. The Anabaptists took their example from the early church uh, and from scripture because the, the state church system had become quite corrupt and, and held a lot of power, both spiritual and political, over the people. And so these radical reformers of the 16th century decided to separate themselves from that church and, and sought to follow the example of Jesus and simply what was in scripture. So what did they take away from the early church? How did early Anabaptists shape themselves based on the early Christians? Well, we know that the early church wasn't perfect and they had lots of issues. And we see that written uh, in many of the letters, for example, from Paul to different churches addressing things they were going through. But in Acts chapter 2, where we kind of see the beginning of the early church, we see these few verses that are kind of like this beautiful picture of what the church was all about. This kind of ideal image of the Christian community. And so um, in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 
42, uh, what Ryan read for us was that they, the, the, the Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, from these few verses, and of course, there's other passages as well that talk about the early church. But we see that, for one thing, the early church emphasized the centrality of community in the way they lived all parts of their lives. It wasn't just, you know, oh, go to church and, and worship and then dispense and see each other the next week. Uh, Jesus changed everything for these early believers, and, and all those who wanted to follow Jesus were invited to live in this new way. So I, I just want to pick up three things from this passage, uh, as well as the example of the early Anabaptists. Uh, for the early church, the Anabaptists learned devotion to spiritual growth, is one way we might put it. Early Anabaptists and early uh, yeah, the early Anabaptists, they were frustrated with the institutional church, which um, instituted practices like the selling of indulgences. And basically, you, you could pay money to the church, and then you would get a certificate that kind of said, now your sins are forgiven. Um, which Kennedy might be a good fundraiser. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> the, the, the Anabaptists saw these things as working against the community and tried to separate themselves from that. They wanted to learn more about Jesus and grow in their relationship with God. And, and they knew that this takes time and this takes input. And, and so we see, you know, uh, early Anabaptists, similarly to the early church, devoting themselves to that, the study of scripture, to prayer, to hearing from people preach, uh, all, all those things that happen in Christian community. For the, for the Anabaptists, their spiritual life was central uh, and centered around the community. And, and what that meant for them uh, was that they acted as a, a priesthood of all believers when it came to their spiritual life. And that means that there's no one who is more qualified or represents God more to the other. All people in Christian community are priests to one another. We, we all uh, either see God in one another or people see God through us. And we can show the love of God to one another and we could receive the love of God as well. And so for early Anabaptists as well as the early church, you know, the, no one person was more important than the other. What that also meant for the early Anabaptists was that they focused on community discernment, which meant that they, they would hear God's will best when they were in dialogue with one another and with when all people participated. Now, for, for us as Anabaptists, for us as Mennonites, we also hold to some of these things when it comes to our devotion to spiritual growth. We, we don't want church just to be a, a Sunday event. We want it to be something that kind of infiltrates all of our life and we can live as Christian community uh, from day to day sharing our life together and growing with one another. And that's why we do, you know, all the things we do outside of Sunday morning when it comes to care groups and Bible studies uh, and different events and, and our, all our meetings and committees and all of that is to engage us in our spiritual growth from day to day. And we, we know that that takes a devotion, that takes a commitment on all of our parts, uh, that it takes time, and it takes energy and, and we need to show up. But we believe that each person is called and gifted by the Holy Spirit to, to do things for the church and to be involved in the church. Each person has a unique voice. And, and in our meetings and from the pulpit, we truly believe that we need to hear each other's voices. We believe that we understand the Bible best when we read it together and when we discuss it and interpret it together. 
And one thing for sure that this means is that the, the pastors of your church don't have all the answers and don't make all the decisions because this spiritual work that we do uh, is something that we do together. Now, the second thing that the early church did that the, that the Anabaptists also picked on uh, was this commitment to communal care. That they, they were together and they had all things in common, we read in that chapter in Acts. Remember that the, the early church and the Anabaptists were both persecuted groups. And in those times, they really banded together, not just when it came to church or, you know, worship, but just to survive. They, they banded together out of solidarity and discovered that it's far easier to follow Jesus's teachings in community than alone. And, and not only is it easier, but it's ideal. And so whenever the church is, is doing fine, you know, we kind of tend to isolate ourselves be, because we can survive on our own. We could do it independently and we can pretend that we don't need each other. But, but in times of persecution, Christians have always been reminded that we can't do this alone and we are better when we are together. And so not only when it comes, you know, to our growth as, as uh, Christians or followers of Jesus, but just in everyday life, sharing life together. For early Anabaptists and for Mennonites, and here comes the stereotypes that I, I had when I first heard about Mennonites, uh, we sometimes see that um, Mennonite groups take this seriously in the sense that they literally have all things in common. Uh, they, they organize themselves in colonies and try to live in such a way um, uh, that seeks uh, community in, in all areas of life. Now for Sterling, you know, this, we don't live as a colony, um, but we do strive our best to do life together. And not just, not just Sunday mornings, but regular life. Knowing that we need each other, whether we want to admit it or not. And so when it comes to caring for one another, um, yeah, that happens through the pastors. But that happens in everyday situations as well. It happens together in, in care groups, in study groups, in, in Bible studies, when we just call up each other and, and go for a visit. We also know that, that it's not just about, you know, spiritual, pastoral care, uh, but it's also about practical support. And so at Sterling, we, we try to follow that example uh, of the early church and the early Anabaptists of helping one another with just our daily needs. In this pandemic, many of you know, we set up a pandemic fund. And, and I don't know the numbers right now, but I'm pretty sure that over 4000 maybe $5,000 has come into that fund and gone out to just help people with groceries or different things because times are tight due to COVID. And another thing when it comes to just living life together, of course, is sharing our families with one another. And one of the biggest joys of... Uh, uh, yeah, of gathering together, uh, for me, is, is seeing all the little ones and seeing them growing and um, interacting with them. And, and that's one of the biggest losses for me in this pandemic as well. So, something we've had to kind of uh, suspend for a little bit. And even our daughter, Clara, you know, not having that, that church family like we had hoped for uh, in the sense of being held by other people, um, being uh, just being played with with other people and all those things. But in ideal times, that's what we try to do, to live life together, um, uh, whether it's in the big moments or just the small moments too. And the last thing uh, that the early church showed that the Anabaptists picked up on was a, a sacrifice for the sake of God's mission. Together, they saw the needs around them and realized that a communal response was much more effective than people just doing their own thing. And so the early church, we read in Acts, they just sold their stuff to, to give to the needy. They, they saw the needs and they sacrificed for the sake of those um, who were poor and those who had need. 
And, and for the Anabaptists uh, who continually try to care for the poor and the needy where, wherever they go, this has been a, a huge emphasis as well. Mennonites have so many different organizations devoted to mutual aid and support and, and, and to the mission of God in the wider world. And for a global church family that's just over a million people, Mennonites actually do a lot. And this is something that I, I didn't know and I was quite surprised by hearing about the work of Mennonite Central Committee or Mennonite Disaster Service, of Mennonite Economic Development Associates, of Christian peacemaker teams of Mennonite Church Canada of camps with me and I could go on and on I think you get the point uh, but one of the things that Anabaptists and Mennonites really emphasize is that there is a call for us to sacrifice for the sake of God's mission and, and we see that at Sterling all the time that we we constantly see need but one of the things we know is that when there's a need the need's going to be met And so to wrap that up, uh, the, the early Anabaptists um, really focused on community as being central to the life um, of their church. And not only when it came to spiritual growth, but also this commitment to communal care and a sacrifice for the sake of God's mission. Now, John D. Roth is, is a teacher and theologian who tried to summarize what it meant to, to have community as central. And I, I really like the way he put it um, when he said, let me just pull that up. When he said that it is the gathered community that nurtures the new convert in the faith, sustaining, challenging, and disciplining the, the disciple in the high calling of following the way of Christ. It is this gathered community not the state, nor the institutional church, nor the family, nor the self. That is the primary focus of God saving acts in history. Now, if there's nothing else you remember from, from today, if you would remember this last line, I, I think this really summarizes what it means to have community as the center of our life. That it is the gathered community that is the primary focus of God saving acts in history. This is something that Anabaptists and Mennonites have always believed and tried hard to live into, and something that we at Sterling want to live into as well. Now this, this means so that we have, uh, or we have learned in this pandemic um, that one thing is true, that the church is not our building. Uh, the church is not located at 1008 Dakota Street, although we would really like to meet in there again. But the church is the gathered community, the gathered community right now. You sitting on your couches or outside or on your beds or wherever you are, we are the gathered community, the gathered community. And we believe that it is through this community, not the church building, not our constitution, not our committees and all that, but through the gathered community, that God is working uh, in the world. I want to leave us with an image today. And, and there's so many different ways that the church has been described uh, in, in the past, right? Communities have sometimes been described like as a body, right? The, a, one body, but many parts. Well, today I want to leave you with uh, one image as we wrap up. And that is the image of a garden. Now, many of you have um, wonderful, wonderful gardens. Um, I, I don't know whose garden this is. I just looked up the picture. But I want to leave you with this image of a garden when talking about community. Think of the plants, um, the flowers, uh, or maybe they're vegetables, but whatever you have in your garden. Uh, think of those as us, right? As the people, as the, those who commit themselves to following after Jesus and living in community. Now think of the gardener as Jesus. Jesus is the one uh, who nurtures and takes care, who prunes and feeds the garden. Jesus is the one who um, gives us what we need in order to grow. And we as a garden are very diverse. 
even in this picture, look at all the different flowers, the different types, the different colors. And we too are, are a community uh, of individuals who are uh, all trying to follow after Jesus. And yet we are different because of our experiences, our backgrounds, our, our, um, our race, our culture, um, our, our family experiences, our sexualities, our gender. All of these things make us different and unique. And yet we are gathered together in this community. And, and so think of the community as the garden box or, or the dirt or the place in which we are planted. The thing that holds us together that is the community. And the question that we always need to wrestle with as we try to shape our community is, are we shaping a community that is nurturing and growing and providing life to those in our community? Are we shaping and nurturing a community where new seeds can be planted? Are we shaping and nurturing a community that is blooming and flourishing for the beauty of the earth, but also for the glory of the gardener? As we prepare, hopefully soon, to return back to worship and gathering in person, my prayer is that we would continue to commit ourselves, commit ourselves to spiritual growth, commit ourselves to communal care, commit ourselves to God's mission, and to continue to nurture and shape this soil that we call community, so that all of us and those who might join us could grow and flourish to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I'm going to share a song as we wrap this up which is uh, new, uh, not the song is new, but we just recorded it. Um, and so I invite you to listen to God of the Bible. to come. You are our center, daylight or darkness, freedom or prison. You are our home. God in our struggles, God in our hunger, suffering with us, taking our part. Still you empower us, mothering spirit, feeding, sustaining,
before we get into our sharing time with one another, and I guess I'll make this uh, announcement if anybody wants to um, add any prayer items, uh, just uh, put them in the chat and, and we can uh, share those uh, in a moment. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to make an announcement and say a prayer because we have um, now completed our discernment for our deacons for this next year. And uh, it's been um, a, a lot of prayer. And so we really appreciate your engagement in that, in um, nominating people to be deacons and, and all those who considered it and prayed about it. Um, we really appreciate that. We also really appreciate those deacons whose terms are coming to an end. And so we wanted to acknowledge the work of Janet Bartell, of Norman Lorraine Roth, and of Brian and Alfreda Bergen for their ministry as deacons in the past number of years. And wanted also to announce that those who have accepted the call and will be starting as deacons in the coming months, I guess in September, um, are Roy and Tannis Lee and Peter and Sandy Entz. So we, we want to say a prayer and invite you to continue to pray for those who are ending their terms and those who will be beginning. Let's pray together. God, we want to thank you so much for the ministry of Sterling and those who have devoted themselves to what you are doing in our community. God, we want to lift up to you Janet Bartell, Brian and Alfreda Bergen, and Norman Lorraine Both, for their many years of service on the pastoral care team, for the time they have given, for the energy they have put in, for the sacrifices they have made to care for this community. God, we want to bless them as they transition out of being deacons and into other things. We pray for a good transition and that they would um, find renewed strength for different areas where you are calling them to serve. And God, we also want to say a prayer um, for Roy and Tannis Lee and for Peter and Sandy Enns, who will be starting uh, their new role on the pastoral care team. We pray for your preparation for them. Um, and we pray for your grace, pray for your strength, your guidance, and your wisdom as they begin to serve this community as deacons. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Moses. Um, thank you for that. Um, journey into what community means for Anabaptists and um, uh, putting some of those things that some of us knew for so long uh, together as we move forward as a community. So I thank you for that. And uh, welcome to our new deacons and uh, many thanks to those who have already served um, recently and in the past. Um, I want to just share some things that have already been shared. So thank you all for uh, your contributions this morning. Um, Emily, Ryan, and Moses, and Andrew. And uh, we hope that we can continue to take this community feeling uh, with us for the rest of our day and uh, ongoing. And stay tuned for what's going to happen in the next number of weeks. Um, I want to ask you now to bow for the benediction. And we will have uh, one more song. Uh, followed by some just time of general visiting. So let's, uh, let's bow together. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit be our goal and our strength now and always. Amen. You're not alone. We are one body, you're not alone, we stand with you, you're not alone, your time of suffering is our suffering too, and I know the day is coming when we will be rejoicing anew.
many members in this body that we know. Some are great and some are small. Eyes and ears and hands and just a little toe. One God who activates them all. We're not alone. We are one body. You're not alone. We stand with you. Spirit formed and spirit fed Different genders, rich 